Let's pray, ladies. Lord, we thank you that truly, Lord, you have called us, Lord. You have chosen us, Lord. We are yours, Lord. You have called us to be part of your body. We are one with you. And so, Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, that you, Lord, would speak to our hearts, Lord. We pray that you would open up your word to our hearts. We pray that you would penetrate, Lord, deep within, Lord, that we might be able to take this word, this word that is alive, this word that is living, this word that is powerful, this word that is sharp, and we pray that we might incorporate it into our lives, and Lord, we might be changed as a result. So Lord, do your work in our hearts this morning. We pray that you would anoint your word, Lord, and may it be straight from your heart to ours this morning, Lord, as we tune our hearts to you and we say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a passage, right? There's, the more you dig, the more you find, right? In this passage, it is just a well of a treasure trove of riches in here when we look. You know, I know some of you know this story, but I can still remember the day 21 years ago, actually, I can't believe that, but we had started a building project, and I remember the day that it came to a screeching halt. We had purchased a home in my husband's dream neighborhood at the beach, and it was just four and a half years old, and upon first inspection of the house, everything just appeared to be just wonderful, and everything was fantastic and great, and we were just going to do some minor remodeling. It wasn't quite to our uh, taste, and we were going to ch- move some walls around and change the inside, and, and it was the fall season, and the rain came, and I got a call from my contractor, and he said, uh, Shelly, we have a problem. I need you to come over here and see this right away. I went, okay, so I I hustled over there, and what they had uncovered, they had torn out some of the walls in the master, in the master bathroom, and there was this black, oozy, gooey stuff coming from the walls, there was white, mushroomy things forming, and there were roots growing up the wood. I went, ooh, this is not what it's supposed to look like in here. It looked like there had been a fire inside. And then by every window, there was a puddle of water. And then we went downstairs, and we could put our feet through the flooring. And we went, oh, my goodness, this is not pretty. It was not good. Our house had definite internal problems. And there was no way we could continue building up until we investigated the problem further and found out what we were dealing with. Here in chapter 5, we see that Nehemiah was not only commissioned as governor to rebuild the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, but in this chapter we see him also being used of God to repair the breach in the walls of God's people. Up to this point, his challenges as spiritual leader had been from the outside. They'd been from outside forces and the outside enemy. But now we see that he's facing a problem that many pastors and preachers face today, problems from within, right? I've entitled this message today, Internal Affairs. You know, we see how here with Nehemiah, the enemy wasn't effective from the attacks from without, so now he tries a different approach, an attack from within, brother versus brother. You know, how many of you seen the TV show with that same title? <laughs> I have. There's a show on, on HGTV called Brother vs. Brother. And it's a great show with two identical twin brothers. And they go out there and they have, a, um, they have a construction project. And they see who can make the most profit. You know, that might be a great name for a TV show. But it's not supposed to be in the body of Christ. The Christian walk is not a competition amongst brothers. We're a family, a team. There should be no verses between brother and brother, right? I remember my grandson used to always ask me, who are they verses? And I went, what does that mean? He meant, who are they against? That means against. It's brother against brother. There should be no brother versus brother. The enemy would love to stifle the work of God as we're so consumed with infighting that we lose sight of the goal. 
and that's to reach this lost world for Jesus Christ, for those that are hurting, that those, those that need a touch from him. Luke eleven seventeen says, a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. So the first point of my message I want to say is the revealing of the problem. Let's look at verses 1 to 5. We reread in verse 1, and there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain for them that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we're forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters are brought into slavery already. It's not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. This was a problem, right? This was a big problem. This was the revealing of the problem, right? To Nehemiah. I love what the New Living Translation says. About this time, some of the men and the women, they raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jewish brothers. They raised a cry. You know, don't you know that that very cry that they raised reached God's ears? When God, God hears the cry of the oppressed, doesn't he? When we cry to the Lord, he hears us. And I love how it says the men and their wives, and their wives, you know, what was happening? Their children were being sold into slavery. You mess with a woman's child and it's like taking a, like a bear that has lost its cubs, right? These women were crying out to the Lord. They were desperate for something to happen. They were losing their children. You know, we can expect attacks from without, but when it happens from within the body, it's hurtful and devastating. This was against their fellow Jewish brothers. David said in Psalm 55, 12 to 14, for it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor it's one who hates me, then who has magnified himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together and we walked to the house of God in the throng. Oh, we can't build together unless we are united together. We are one body. We are one team, one family. I remember one time my granddaughter and their family, they were, like I said that, my granddaughter and their family, my son and his family too. Um, a grandmother's heart. Um, they were. They have four kids, and they were boarding an airplane. And somebody asked them, "Are you guys a sports team?" And then she looked at them and said, "No, we're a family." And I just thought that was so funny. They all look a little bit different. One is adopted in the mix, and um, but they thought, "Oh, they must be a sports team." And said, "No." We're a family. We are all the family of God, but we are also a team, right? Building together and working together side by side, shoulder to shoulder, as we have seen in the previous chapters. Ephesians 4, 15, 16 says, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We are to build each other up in the love of Christ. I love Psalm 133, one says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Oh, God wants us to be a united front. He wants us to be one in him. So we see these three groups of people. What was their cry? We see the first group, they had large families, but not enough food. Second group had large mortgages, and they couldn't buy food. And we see the third group, they had large taxes, and they were forced to mortgage their land, and some had to sell their children to pay for their mortgages. The rich were destroying their brothers, who had been redeemed from slavery and forcing them back into slavery once again. They were taking advantage of their desperate situation and out of selfishness and self-centeredness, they were using them for their own personal gain by selling their loans with exorbitant in interest rates. We see how in, the, in our lesson we talked about it too, but how the law strictly forbade these practices. But I just want to look at one of those scriptures here. It says, Exodus 22:25 25 says, 
If you lend money to any of my people who are in need, do not charge interest as a money lender would. If you take your neighbor's cloak as security for a loan, you must be return it before sunset. This coat may be the only blanket your neighbor has. How can a person sleep without it? If you do not return it and your neighbor cries out to me for help, then I will hear, for I am merciful. Do you love that? That is the Lord caring about one person who doesn't have a coat at night. And he is crying out. That cry of the oppressed reaches his ears. And he says he hears, for he is merciful. He cares whether you're warm at night. He cares about that one, that one person who may not have a blanket. He says, return it. Don't you care? Don't you have compassion? I do. Our God is a compassionate, merciful God. Leviticus 25 says, if, and starting in verse 35, if one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and cannot support himself, support him as you would a foreigner or a temporary resident. Allow him to live with you. Don't charge interest or make a profit at his expense. Instead, show your fear of God by letting him live with you as your relative. Remember, do not charge interest on money you lend him or make a profit on food you sell him. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. God had taken them out of slavery and set them free. And he's saying, don't put your brothers back into slavery. I have set them free. Oh, ladies, we need to know that Jesus is the one that sets us free. He says again, and I love how I'm going to cut through a few of these. No, I'm not. I'm reaping. <laughs> if one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell himself to you, do not treat him as a slave. Treat him instead as a hired worker, as a temporary resident who lives with you, and he will serve you only until the year of Jubilee. At that time, he and his children will no longer be obligated to you, and they will return to their clans and go back to the land originally allotted to their ancestors. The people of Israel are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, so they must never be sold as slaves. Show your fear of God by treat, not treating them harshly. We are to show our fear of God in all of these dealings. The building of this wall, did it create these problems? Did it create these problems amongst these brothers? No, it didn't, did it? It didn't cause the problems. The problem was already there. The building process just revealed it, didn't it? In our house that we were building, the leaks and the mold were already in the house. They were already behind these walls. But it wasn't until it rained and as we began to expose the walls to the light of day and to our vision that we saw what was going on inside. We saw this internal ugliness that was exposed. If we were to just put that drywall back and cover up the problem, then those roots that were taking form, they would have taken off and eaten our house, the entire inside of our house, in such a short time that that whole house could have collapsed on our heads. This wasn't your normal kind of mold that we had. This wasn't like the black mold. This was a house that actually eats wood. And so if Nehemiah, too, were to ignore this problem that was going on, he could have said, ah, oh, guys, just work it out for yourselves. It's not my problem, right? this problem would have only gotten worse. In a church, Wiersbe says, problems arise, and if you ignore them, they just grow deeper roots and bear bitter fruits. Isn't that true? In a church, problems arise, but we need to take care of them when we need to handle them. The problem here wasn't only on the inside of their own walls, but it was on the inside of their own hearts, wasn't it? The problem lied with the fact that they were being selfish. There was selfishness. And you know what? If you think about that, isn't that actually the root of all of our problems? Selfishness, pride, the what about me, things that go on in our life. What about me? You know, my husband said something to me the other day. He says, well, wherever you go, there you are. And I thought, you know, we take ourselves with us wherever we go, right? I am my own worst problem because inside of me dwells no good thing. I can be selfish and I need to always constantly give that to the Lord. 
I love to quote Pastor Greg. He says, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, right? We can't blame our bad behavior on our circumstances or what's going on around us. It is actually what's going on our heart, and it just reveals what's inside our heart. Just like our house, the problem wasn't the rain or the construction. The fungus was deeply embedded within the wood, and it had roots that sought out water, which fed its growth and the house's destruction. The problem was embedded deep within the framework. I remember how painful it was when we first started putting hammer through walls that appeared to look perfectly fine. They looked great, but then underneath what we saw and what was exposed was, was awful. I could see, we tore out a bathroom, and when we water tested the roof, we could see water skipping down the two by fours like a, like this, like a waterfall. It was coming in so hard. We saw beams that were black, and we could just actually pull and splinter like toothpicks. We saw um, our cupboards, the back of all the cupboards had to come off, and we saw black, we saw this black oozy mold. It was a fungus that's called Poria and Crisata. The UC Riverside plant pathology professor said it's the most devastating wood decay fungus of houses that we know of. It can render a house worthless. Within a year, it can destroy a house. It can grow as much as an inch a day inside the walls and floors, never noticed until it breaks out into view. It actually had roots growing, and we could actually punch our fist through, through a sheer wall. We, ladies, need to expose our hearts to the light of God's word, don't we? Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of your words give light. Uh, you know, it is the light of God's word that changes us. Last Sunday, I love what Eric Metaxas came and shared with us, didn't you all? When he shared with us about Martin Luther, and I had just been reading about him for this study a little bit. You know, I can't wait to get his book and read it. There's one slogan that was going on in the days of Martin Luther, and it was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Martin Luther, as he began to read the Bible for himself and discover the truth of God's word, he could no longer go along with these indulgences that were conning the people out of the money as they were told that they could purchase a pardon from God that would purge them from a place called purgatory. One biographer writes, as a preacher, a pastor, and a professor, he felt it his duty to protest. To be silent was to betray his theology and his conscience. So he posted his 95 theses on the, um, on the door of the castle at the church at Wittenberg. And when he did that, it was a chain reaction that started that set into play a movement that would change the whole world even up to this present day. When Luther was asked to recant these words that he had written, as he stood before Emperor Charles V in April 1521, he replied, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Thus I cannot and I will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. God help me, amen. He knew that he couldn't go against the word of God and he needed to bring to light what the, this injustice that was happening just to see the hearts of the people needed to change because he saw that you couldn't buy God's forgiveness. You couldn't buy this with money in, a, in, the, in the coffer. And he saw the injustice that was being done to the poor to benefit those that were already rich. Well, Nehemiah was made aware of the problem that was going on around him, too, as the people raised a cry that reached God's ears. It was brought to Nehemiah's attention, too. He was pretty new on the scene and probably was previously unaware of the situation, but the Lord knew, and he wanted to deal it, with it, so he brought the situation to light. So in our second point, we see how Nehemiah exhibits this righteous indignation. We read in verse 6 how he became very angry when he heard their outcry, when he heard these words. You know, this wasn't a hissy fit or a temper tantrum. This was righteous indignation at the abuses that were taking place amongst brethren. 
These poor Jews were experiencing burden upon burden, and instead of helping to lighten their load of their fellow brothers, they were just piling on more bricks and taking advantage of them for their own personal gain. They were promoting themselves at the expense of their brothers. Have you ever heard of a grave injustice against an innocent and you were angered as a result? You know, sometimes I hear about different cons that are taking place amongst the elderly and different people that are calling them and, and taking them out of their life savings and they're innocent, they don't understand and they are con. And you get so upset, you, it makes you angry, doesn't it? Well, it makes God angry too when he sees these injustices. He pleads the cause of those that are oppressed. When you see a child that is abused or a wife that is battered and abused, or don't, doesn't it make you angry? It does God when he sees this too. We need to go, we need to give it to him. There is a righteous anger that's angry at sin because we know the devastation that it brings. Ephesians 4.26 says, though, in your anger, do not sin. So before Nehemiah spoke to these people, he consulted within himself, the Bible says. I, you know, given Nehemiah's track record in the path, don't, in the past, don't you know that he didn't just talk to himself and say, okay, self, what would you do, right? We know that ne before Nehemiah did anything, he, what did he do? He prayed. He knew that he knew that he had the audience of the king. He knew that God would give him wisdom as he called out to him. God gives us wisdom when we call out to him for wisdom. He promises it to all who would ask for it. And when we ask him, he gives it. Oh, Nehemiah was a man who knew he had God's ear. And we see that he knew how to handle this matter as he sought God's wisdom and his counsel. Wearsby says that Nehemiah was not a politician who asked what is popular, or he wasn't a diplomat who asked what is safe, but he was a true leader who asked what is right. Nehemiah wanted to do what is right, not just to please the people, but he wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. So Nehemiah shares a rebuke with the people. That is the third point. He says, after serious thought, in verse 7, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and I said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brothers. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who are sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? And it says, and they were silenced and found nothing to say. They had nothing to say on their own behalf. And he said, what you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of our nations, our enemies? They were giving cause for the nations, or the enemy, the nations to blaspheme God's name. The enemies of God could say, this is what happens amongst you who your God has no power in your life. When we, as God's people, when we live in not living in the fear of God, when we do things that are contrary to his nature and contrary to his character, we blaspheme the name of God and people around us say, that's what your God like, looks like? I thought you were Christians. What you guys are doing isn't any different than what I'm doing, so why would I want what you want? Oh, ladies, we need to represent our, our God. We are called Christians. What we are to be Christ-like in our behavior. We are to represent him and not care about selfish interests when we fail to love our neighbor as ourselves. Our witness to the world is ruined. If we act as the world acts, why would they want to become believers? We are no different than they. John 13, 35 says that they'll know that we're Christians by the love that we have one for the other. Oh, when they see that love, isn't it just drawing and they want what we have? People come here and they say, I just see such love here. People are going to be drawn to it like honey, and they're going to want it. We need to draw people to the Lord with the honey, with his love, right? Nehemiah walked in the fear of the Lord, and that's why he could encourage his brothers to do the same. He didn't just say it with his lips, he demonstrated it through his life. Oswald Chambers says, the remarkable thing about the fear of God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you don't fear God, you fear everything else. 
You know, we should seek to glorify God in everything we do as we listen to him and as we obey his word. You know, I, if these were New Testament believers, I could just hear Nehemiah saying these words to them from Philippians 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Can't you just hear Nehemiah saying the words of Paul to his fellow brothers? Not only did he demonstrate what it looked like to walk in the fear of the Lord, but he showed through his actions how to treat one another. As he, we see in verse 10 how it says that he actually loaned them money himself. And when you look further into verse, verses 14 through 19, we see in his example how he himself did not charge them interest. He did not want to um, take any money from them. He didn't want to take taxes from them that were, could have been due him because he knew that this would add to the burden of the people. And he did not want to add burden upon burden to their already hard situation. And so he used his own expenses to build this wall, to go forth and stand side by side with his brothers and lower himself to build this wall. Don't you see in him just an example of Christ when you look at our example in Nehemiah? In verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Nehemiah lowered himself. He was humble. He did not want to lord over the people, and he did not want to take from the people anything that could have been due him, and yet he himself did not demand these, these taxes from the people. He supported himself. Nehemiah shares the remedy in our fourth point, and that is to restore and repay and to repent. In verse 10, Nehemiah says, I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day, and you must repay the interest you charge when you lent the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. And they replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. The whole, responded, whole assembly responded, amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Do you love that? They completely repented. They forgave these people's debt. They forgave their debt. And they said, we will do as you say, amen, so be it. And the people did as they had promised. Oh, I love that. They, these people totally repented. They heeded his words. Isn't that so awesome? Because so often you'll share something with somebody, you'll share a rebuke with somebody and it's not received, but these people received it wholeheartedly. And they let them free of their debt and returned their land and their property. This was like the year of Jubilee for Israel. In Leviticus 25, when we read of that year of Jubilee, it was also known as that year of liberty. It was proclaimed on the 50th year. It was after a cycle of seven cycles of seven years. And when they blew the ram's horn on the Day of Atonement, it signified a call to celebration, liberation, and the beginning of a year for doing justice and loving mercy. This was a year to proclaim liberty throughout the land. Debts were canceled, land returned, and if people had sold themselves into slavery, slavery, do you like, I'm talking like a little kid, slavery, or as an indentured servants to repay a debt, they were, it was, um, 
They were set free. Their debt was set free. It was a year to start afresh. God wants us to be free, to be free of sin and the bondage that it brings. He wants us to be free of shame, free of guilt, free to worship him. You know, our freedom was bought at a great price, was it not? We are free to worship him. We didn't have to pay for this. It didn't cost us anything. We don't have to put money in the offering every time it goes around to, to obtain our salvation, to obtain our freedom from the debts that we owe. We paid a debt we couldn't owe, right? These people had a debt that they could not pay. So do we. We have a debt that we cannot pay. And yet Jesus is the one who paid our debt for us. It is free to us, but it cost him a great deal. Our freedom was bought at a great, at a great price by our kinsman, redeemer, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God manifested in the flesh. He left his throne in heaven and became a babe born in a manger, and he walked and he dwelt among men. He had no pillow for his head. He said he came as one who serves. He was ridiculed and he was mocked and he was tortured. And he died a criminal's death on the cross so that our debts could be forgiven and we could be set free from the curse of death and the enemy's grasp. Such love, such humility. Oh, happy day, the day that Jesus washed my sins away, right? When we looked at these verses, we look at these verses even out of Philippians, Paul says, let this mind be in you. This is the mind that he wants us to have, the same mind, this lowly mind. Oh, Jesus and he reads in Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus reads from the book of Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liber liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, happy day. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. And then Jesus asks us to forgive us. He asks us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. He says to, we are to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He calls us to forgive others the same way we've been forgiven, right? Jesus came and he forgave us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. He doesn't recall them to our account any longer. He casts them as far as the east is from the west. He, posts, he puts them into the deepest sea and he posts a no fishing allowed sign, doesn't he? He says he doesn't recall our debts to us, or our sins to us any longer. And that is the way he says that we are to forgive the debts of others. There's freedom as we forgive the debts of others. There's freedom in forgiveness. Not only are our debtors set free, but as we forgive the debts of others, we are also set free. As we let them out of debtor's prison, we ourselves are let out of our own prison, right? That prison of bitterness, that prison of resentment, that, that prison of, of anger, and we can release it to the Lord. And we can say, Lord, it's yours, it's gone. And we need to forgive others as we too have been forgiven, to forgive the debts of others. You know, ladies, if we live and try only to satisfy our own needs and our own greeds, it's like trying to fill an endless well from the bottomless pit. It's never satisfied, right? We are never satisfied. But there is joy and there is freedom when we operate in the light of this Philippians 2 passage, when we put the needs of other people above our own. When I put my husband's needs above my own, when I'm like, when you can be so tired and maybe they need something, you to, you to do something for them, or you want to minister to your husband, and just whether your own needs are met or not, or your children. We, need to, we are constantly ministering to the needs of our children. You know, I've heard one phrase, it says, you'll know how much of a servant you are 
when you're treated like one? Are we, do we truly have that servant's heart? Maybe in our home we're treated like a servant and a slave, and all of a sudden we get, wait, I don't like that. It can cause us to bristle up that God wants us to be servants of all. He says we are servants of all. We are great in his kingdom. There's power. These people repented fully. There's power in repentance, isn't there? D.L. Moody says, a man is born with his face turned away from God. When he truly repents, he is turned right around and faces God. Repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, and it results in a change of action. When we turn from our sin, when we turn from the wrongdoing, we turn to God. We turn and we follow after him and we follow after his ways. We need to submit to God. We need to resist the devil and he will flee for us. James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, I thought about when, you know, it was probably very painful for them to have their, these sins exposed in the midst of the whole congregation when Nehemiah told them what they were doing was wrong, what you're doing is not good in front of everybody. When we have our sins exposed to the light of the Lord, it hurts, right? It's painful. But when we expose our deeds to him, we can know that God who hears these confessions as we confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't need to fear coming to him with our sins. We don't need to fear coming to our merciful God. We don't need to fear coming to him as we pour out our hearts, as we break our hearts before him. He is the one that lifts us up. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. When we are broken before God, when we come before him and we tear our heart before him, he is the one that lifts us up. He is the one that wants to heal us. We need to ask God to search our hearts. We need to ask him to reveal to us if there's anything hiding in us that needs to be torn down. When we had exposed our house to the light of the, of the sky, we had to take the roof off. We had to take the exterior plaster off. We had to take all of the interior drywall off of our house. We had to basically expose all of the framing, all of this faulty framing to the world, and they could see the ugliness within. When we expose ourselves to the light of God's word, He is the one that cleanses us. He is the one that purifies us. And he is the one that can change us as he is the one that can tear out what is inside of us. Uh, We need to take radical measures. We need to go before God and ask him to cleanse our hearts. Joel 2 says, turn to me now while there's time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief. Instead, tear your hearts. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He is not easily angered. He is filled with kindness and is eager not to punish you. We need to pray, Lord, break my heart with the things that break yours. Uh, Before Jerusalem, before they could begin this building up process, they needed this tearing down. God wanted to build in them brotherly love, unity, holiness, godly character. Is there anything in our lives that he wants to expose? Anything that he wants to tear down? The Bible says love builds up. A wise woman builds her house, but a foolish one tears it down with their own hands. Is there anything I'm doing to tear down the body of Christ? Is there anything I'm doing that tears down my house? I need to ask myself, what are my motives as I serve him? Am I walking in the fear of the Lord? Am I seeking to promote myself or to lift up others? Am I guilty of being so self-focused that I don't see the needs of those around me? Am I a God-pleaser or a man-pleaser? Nehemiah was a God-pleaser. He sought the audience of one, didn't he? He sought to please God. Oh, I need to pray 
Rid me of myself. I belong to you. When the Lord shows me the faulty framework, will I respond as these Jewish believers responded? Yes, I will do as you say. Amen. So be it, Lord. Amen. Lord, I thank you that you are the one that cleanses, you are the one that forgives, you are the one that restores. And Lord, you want us to be one in you. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us such an example to follow, Lord, through, through yourself, Lord, and Lord, even through one of the, your um, believers, through Nehemiah, Lord, as he portrayed you, Lord, as we see from his character how we might live and follow you, how he sought to please your house your heart, Lord, yours only, how he lived, Lord, to seek an eternal reward, Lord, not a temporal one. May we seek, Lord, to please you with all of our heart, Lord. May we seek to build up the body of Christ around us, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that we, Lord, would be used by you, Lord, as an instrument, Lord, as we desire, Lord, to portray you to portray your image, Lord, to a world around us, Lord, a world that needs to see Jesus, a world that needs to see what the body of Christ looks like as we walk in the fear of you, Lord, as we portray you to this world, Lord. So teach us, Lord. Show us, reveal to us, Lord. And, and Lord, if we pray, Lord, if we are holding on to any unforgiveness, Lord, of other peoples, if we are not forgiving any debts that are owed to, that we feel are owed to us, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you, Lord, would just... Lord, cleanse us of that sin too, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would release us, Lord. Release us out of this debtor's prison, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you proclaim a year of jubilee, Lord, to all of us, Lord, that you, Lord, have set us free. May we walk as the king's kids, Lord. May we walk as children who have been set free, Lord, by the power of your blood, Lord. Thank you that you paid the price, Lord, so that we don't have to. We love you, give you the glory, honor and praise, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that all we say and all that we do would be motivated by this love, by your love, would be controlled by your truth, Lord, and would be done to the glory of God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.